use money to pay for goods, services, debts, and other stuff. For most of human history, it was physical objects, like coins or paper notes, that performed the function of money. Today, we also have access to digital money, which is stored and exchanged over digital computer systems. Economists usually define three functions of money. One, a medium of exchange. Two, a unit of account, meaning a standard numerical unit to measure how much things are worth, and three, a store of value. Anything that can fulfill these three functions well can be used as money. For the purpose of this video, we will differentiate between public money and private money, and further between centralized private money and decentralized private money. Public money is the money that is issued by the central bank. In Switzerland, the only form of public money available to private individuals are the Swiss francs in paper notes and coins. All other forms of money that we use, including bank deposits, credit card spending limits, or PayPal balances, are actually private money. In particular, all forms of digital money currently used are private money. Centralized private money is characterized by a central authority which decides how that money is managed. An example of centralized private money are credit card spending limits. It may be odd to think that paying with a bank transfer actually means paying with private money because the amount is expressed in Swiss francs. However, think of what happens when your bank approves a loan to you. Suddenly, you have more money that you can spend. In effect, the bank has created more money. That money that was created, that is the bank's private money. Paying with private money is different from paying by cash. First, a credit card company collects fees on each transaction it executes. Importantly, the amount of the fees is determined by the companies themselves and depends on the level of competition between the firms. The fact that many credit cards offer points or even cash for using them suggests that those transaction fees might be too high. Customers don't pay these transaction fees, but sellers do, and as you can see from this sign, they are not too happy about it. Second, Private money is not guaranteed to be accepted by all businesses. Third, providers of private money can refuse to work with businesses they find unsavory. If all digital payments are provided by a handful of firms, this gives them an enormous amount of power over our societies and power to act without democratic oversight. These drawbacks of centralized private money have led people to develop decentralized private money. An example of such decentralized private money are cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin, where there is no centralized authority that decides what are the transaction fees or who is allowed to make payments or not. No cryptocurrency has been widely used as an actual currency, as of now at least. However, Cryptocurrencies have generated sufficient interest that central banks have started worrying that cryptocurrencies might start seeing wider adoption. After Facebook-backed Libra was announced, central banks were worried that, given the reach and resources of Facebook, Libra might prove so convenient and so attractive to consumers that it would become a dominant currency at least in countries with a less developed banking sector. If that was to happen, central banks would lose the power to conduct monetary policy, which has been the cornerstone of the modern financial system and an indispensable tool for maintaining the system's stability. The regulators were not going to allow that to happen. While they managed to stop Libra, the worry remained that they would not be able to stop the next attempt unless 
a convenient and safe public digital payment system was developed so that there would be no demand for a cryptocurrency-based money. This is one of the main reasons why many central banks are currently exploring the option of introducing a central bank digital currency. A central bank digital currency, or CBDC for short, is the digital equivalent of a central bank issued paper currency. In practice, launching a CBDC would mean allowing private individuals to open accounts with the central bank and allowing them to make payments that debit those accounts at the central bank directly. Currently, central banks of more than 100 countries, representing over 95% of global GDP, are exploring CBDCs. For example, China had been testing a digital currency since 2020 with millions of users. There are multiple benefits to a CBDC. In particular, it has the potential to lower transaction costs and to enable public control of digital payment processing. But a CBDC could also enable governments to precisely track and control how individuals spend money. And some worry that the option to move money quickly and easily to a safe central bank account could provoke bank runs, as individuals would empty their accounts at commercial banks at the earliest sign of trouble. Finally, if many individuals choose to keep their deposits at the central bank instead of commercial banks, this would require the central bank to decide how to use these resources. Central banks could face political pressure in allocating these assets, which could lead to an inefficient allocation. Overall, digitalization is already causing massive changes to the way we pay. In our everyday life, the changes might be small, but these changes could lead to a completely different financial system in the future.